Hello and welcome back to session one of the Cambridge Conference on Catastrophic Risk. In this session, pre-2000, we're going to be looking at what existential risk studies really looked like before the publication of Martin's book and how these themes feed into the kind of work that existential and global catastrophic risk scholars are doing today. Uh, we have two fantastic panelists who have been at the forefront of not only studying but preventing global catastrophes uh, for many, many decades. Uh, Francesco Cavallero has a distinguished career as a mathemat mathematical and theoretical physicist, uh, but we've got him here for his lifelong commitment to nuclear disarmament, um, including having served as the Secretary General of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and Global Affairs, uh, one of the longest running and most influential organizations uh, aimed at the prevention of existential risk. Um, and in that capacity, he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize along with David Rothbart in 1995 for their work. Uh, we also have Malcolm Potts, who has, as Martin mentioned in his talk, uh, spent his life as an orthopedic surgeon and reproduction scientist working on issues of population health and sustainability. Um, Malcolm was founder of the Bixby Center for Population Health and Sustainability and was also CEO of Family Health International. Um, he's spent a life working really hard to um, promote sustainability and response to environmental risks of the overpopulation. But I think it's also really important to note that he had an important role in tackling global catastrophic biological risks. Um, during his time as CEO of Family Health International, they were the leading provider of family uh, planning and contraception during the AIDS pandemic of the 1980s, uh, which is certainly the most uh, deadly and significant pandemic and, and global biological catastrophe of modern times still really leaving in shade in the shade COVID-19 both in terms of the fatality of that pandemic and also its impacts on uh, affected communities and countries. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Tom McLean you may have noticed in the last session he's providing a visual summary of everything that's going on and you'll be able to see his drawings develop in the corner of the screen. Um, please do leave questions in the um, Zoom or Hoover chat, uh, and they'll be passed through to me and inform our later discussions. Um, I think that's everything from me. So over to Francesco, who will be providing our first talk. I am Francesco Calogero, and I will focus on the catastrophic risk to the survival of Homo sapiens associated with the existence of nuclear weapons, the risk discussed by Martin Rees in chapter three of his book, Our Final Century, which is the foundational document for this meeting. In this talk, I will tersely outline some developments which have emerged in the last decade regarding this risk. And I will also indicate in the concept of deterrence, the basic fallacy in the mainstream thinking about the strategic relevance of nuclear weapons, a fallacy which might eventually lead to their use with catastrophic consequences. A long overdue positive development was the statement by President Barack Obama in Prague, 5 April 2009, about 10 years ago, if more. And now I quote from Obama. So today, I state clearly and with conviction America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. I'm not naive. This goal will not be reached quickly, perhaps not in my lifetime. It will take patience and persistence. But now we too must ignore the voices who tell us that the world cannot change. We have to insist. Yes, we can. Unquote. But under President Donald Trump, the opposite development has occurred. The nuclear arms control architecture that had been realized over time has been gradually dismantled. Now I speak Latin for a moment. Si vis pacem para bellum. Namely, if you want peace, prepare for war. This advice was probably rather sensible in many occasions throughout human history. But these were circumstances in which the primary goal was to avoid war, if at all possible, but otherwise to win the war. Now, every reasonable person understands that, and I quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, as firstly jointly proclaimed by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Hence, 
any reasonable version of nuclear strategy, but have as its primary goal the prevention of nuclear war, indeed of any deliberate use of nuclear weapons. Sophisticated deterrence theories have been proposed to justify the acquisition of nuclear weapons by countries, but they are demonstrably flawed and likely to lead to a catastrophic outcome, which has been avoided so far only thanks to the insubordination of individuals who did not follow the instructions mandated by such theories, as some well-known examples demonstrated. When fools are in charge of critical important planning concerning the employment of weapons of mass destruction, we must worry. But we can have little hope of redress after we witness that theories which are both foolish and dangerous continue to provide the dominant paradigm of the thinking about the operational command and control of nuclear weaponry. My conclusion is that we must responsibly point out to relevant authorities and to public opinions that the world with large numbers of high yield nuclear weapons, the purpose of which is to deter the use of nuclear weapons by potential enemies, has now been shown to be based on stupid rules. Indeed, survival has been experimentally demonstrated to require that those rules not be followed. And by the way, the rules meant to implement nuclear deterrence be clearly foolish. The enemy has every reason to expect that they, in fact, shall not be implemented. Hence, there is no logic in the claim that deterrence over time worked, as presumably demonstrated by the fact that the world was spared the actual use of nuclear weapons for over 70 years. In fact, the world has not witnessed a catastrophic employment of nuclear weapons after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not thanks to nuclear deterrence, but in spite of nuclear deterrence, only because the rules meant to implement nuclear deterrence were never followed. Yet, the myth of the effectiveness of nuclear deterrence continues to be instrumental to sustain the development and deployment of nuclear weaponry, and the belief of its relevance is the main cause impeding progress towards the elimination of nuclear weaponry. Moreover, it now begins to be, in a sense, quite logically suggested that in order to guarantee that the threat of catastrophic retaliation on which the deterrence theory is based, in order that it be a certainty, its implementation should be turned over to intelligent computers so as to eliminate the unreliable intervention of humans and thereby make it quite certain that nuclear deterrence works, opening eventually the way to the intervention of more intelligent hackers, themselves having perhaps given over the initiative of their intervention to artificial intelligence entities. A final message. If you suspect that the point of view expressed above about the current operational aspects of nuclear deterrence is excessively alarmistic, you are advised to read the short paper. It is dated September 10, 2019, so a little over one year ago. It's available, for instance, from the website of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The paper is entitled A Common Sense Policy for avoiding a disastrous nuclear decision. It is authored by James Winnefeld, who served as the Commander-in-Chief of All American Nuclear Weapons and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff of the United States until very few years ago. This short paper, written with the very best intention, is in fact a terrifying description of the current operational situation and of the strategic thinking underlying the actual employment of nuclear weaponry as described by someone who has been until quite recently in charge of it in one of the two nuclear weapon superpowers. The diagnosis of the risks of the current situation is coming from such a competent source quite compelling. While the proposed improvement is quite reasonable in the framework of the deterrence ideology, it does demonstrate a remarkable frame of mind, maybe an occupational disease. Four alternative scenarios are envisaged. Two are viewed as, in some sense, successful, including the one resulting in a full nuclear annihilation having the dubious merit to be symmetrical, hence more universal. 
and by the way, demonstrating a catastrophic failure of the term. Let me end by quoting verbatim from this published text, which is reachable, reachable by every one of you by Google. And from here to the end of my talk, I just quote from this text. So, quotation. Ultimately, two variables are in play. The first is whether the perceived attack is real, regardless of whether the president is certain that the information he or she is receiving is accurate. The second is whether the president orders an immediate response. There are thus four ways in which any given scenario could play out. If the attack is not real and the president is uncertain and does not launch, the outcome, as worrisome as it is, is merely a close call. The opposite case occurs if the attack is real and the president overcomes any uncertainty and launches an immediate response. While nobody in their right mind wants a nuclear exchange, nobody wants to fail to respond to one either. However, the other two cases are both disasters that ought to be preventable. Either the attack is real and the president does not launch due to uncertainty, or the attack is not real, but the president launches an unrecallable immediate response in spite of the uncertainty. Unfortunately, intense time pressure and the fog of war coupled with the mindset that the only two options are an immediate launch or doing nothing, renders these catastrophes more likely than someone who has never rehearsed the process may think. That's the end of the quote and the end of my talk. And thank you, Francesco, for that. Um, and now over to Malcolm. There are more people in India today than there were on the whole planet when my parents were born. I think that is one way of sort of emphasizing what huge changes in population we've had in this one 45th millionth of the time there's been life on Earth and how we've changed everything. So human numbers have an impact on diversity, on biodiversity, on land and in the sea, on climate mitigation and climate adaptation and on virtually everything that we're talking about at this meeting that relates to the existential crises facing the world, the loss of the biosphere, hunger, access to education, jobs, and conflict. So improving family planning is the most cost-effective way to slow rapid population growth in a human rights framework. It reduces poverty by accelerating economic growth. It cuts maternal deaths by 50% improves the quality of education and makes it more likely the next generation will have satisfactory employment. As the 9-11 Commission uh, reminded us, a high ratio of young, poorly educated men is a recipe for conflict. Globally, family planning is not telling people what to do, it's giving them what they want. Globally, there are about 80 million more births and deaths each year. It's estimated that there are 120 million unintended pregnancies every year. Six out of 10 of these end in abortion and cause probably more than 20,000 preventable deaths. So women are telling us in blood that they do not have the access to family planning that is their birth rate. Making family planning easily and universally available should be as straightforward as vaccinating children against infections. Yet international family planning is seriously under, underfunded. Only 1% of foreign aid as tracked by the OECD goes to family planning, only 1%. I suggest that all of us that are concerned with existential risks adopt three simple policies. The first, is whenever it's possible and appropriate, draw attention to the impact of population growth on a particular issue and the potential of investing in family planning to slow that growth. For example, there was a recent uh, paper by uh, Gibb, I think in, in Nature, about the spread of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. It concluded that the global, global changes in the mode 
and the intensity of land use are creating expanding hazardous interfaces between people, livestock, and wildlife reservoirs of zoonotic diseases. The authors did not add, but they should have added at that point, that it would be useful to increase in access to family planning and slow the spread of diseases such as COVID-19. The second opportunity I think we all enjoy is to lobby to double the proportion of overseas aid spent on family planning from 1% to 2%. That should be politically achievable. We're not threatening the other lobbyists who come paid over the 99% and only going to have 98%. But I think that um, transferring that, doubling th that investment from 1% to 2% of foreign aid would have a very significant impact on what happens in the rest of this century. Demographers estimate that if couples on average have half a child more than the current median projection for the year 2100, we would have a global population of about 16 billion, clearly totally unsustainable. If people on average had half a child fewer, then the global population would probably be about 6 billion, which would be much more valuable. So I think that doubling the money going into population would have a, a dramatic, important and uh, impact on the world we're living in and the existential uh, challenges we faced. The third um, possibility, which I would like to policy, I would like to emphasize, is something that Martin just said, that young people are 30 years ahead of the older people who uh, cohorts that command power on earth. And I, I find teaching younger people very inspiring. And I say to my classes, if my grandchildren are to live in a sustainable world, it's not going to be because of what I do, it's because of what you, the next generation of undergraduates do. So I would like to suggest that the Center for Existential Challenges probably tries to collect and share the teaching that's taking place in some universities um, on a sustainable world. The class I teach is, is, uh, is called a sustainable world colon, opportunities and challenges. The opportunities come before the challenges. And it's run by the students. The students select the student, they select the teachers, they um, run the discussion uh, sections. So I think that is you know, very, very important that we um, I've, you know, invest in young people and let them take charge. They are inspiring and committed, and they are the solution, if there is a solution, to the existential challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, and uh, thanks, Francesco. In the green room before these talks, uh, Francesco was I was expressing some concern about how he was going to answer, uh, deal with the questions, because uh, these are two very different issues with their own big problems. And um, I think anyone would, would agree that to, to have some understanding of nuclear deterrence um, is hard enough and to have some understanding of global population sustainability is hard enough. And I wanted to reassure um, both Francesco and Malcolm that I was not expecting them to be able to talk on the problems that each other had faced. But it's my view that anyone who um, is really gonna understand, let alone try to prevent these big global challenges that we face has to deal with some important common problems. Um, and I think that's definitely true of these two speakers. Uh, roughly speaking, you can put these into two groups, kind of how we, would, how we understand a better world and how we actually try to bring that about. Um, so before we have the questions from the floor, I wanted to have a little bit of a conversation about that. However, before even getting to that, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge the fact that this is a panel of three men, three white men, and this is not 
what Caesar uh, tries to do with our panel set is not in any way detracting from the fantastic presentations we've just had. Um, we did invite uh, several female people uh, participants to be on this panel and we didn't get anywhere. Um, but as this is a panel about acknowledging and uh, learning from people who contributed a lot to the field, I just wanted to briefly mention three um, female women who I think have also contributed a huge amount. Uh, and maybe we can draw on them or, or on other more diverse people in our responses. Uh, so Rachel Carson is someone uh, who not only really opened a lot of people's eyes to the scope of the environmental challenge facing us, uh, but also provided in my mind a real playbook for how to use cool reason to overcome quite hysterical opposition uh, from industry and its lobbying community. Um, Donella Meadows was someone who I think contributed a huge amount to the studying of global systems and her short book, uh, Thinking in Systems, is a good primer that I would recommend to anyone really trying to understand global complexity and how it relates to any of the global challenges that we face. And another one of my great heroes of existential and global catastrophic risk, uh, not only did she really shape the emergence of the sustainable development agenda with her influential commission to the UN, uh, not only was she the, president, uh, the Prime Minister of Norway during the Oslo Peace Accords and really helped get closer than anyone has to uh, peace in the Middle East and all the international tension that that causes, but of course she was also president of the WHO at the time of the SARS uh, pandemic. And I think her very rapid and sensible action helped to prevent SARS-CoV-1 from being the same as SARS-CoV-2. Um, so having mentioned those three influential women, back to the panel. Um, just starting with you, Francesco, I think one of the things that I noticed from your two talks is you both gave really good articulations of the global challenges that we face and how these relate to global catastrophic risk. Um, I felt to some extent your talk was looking more at the big picture of nuclear risk, obviously highlighting the, the risks uh, associated with nuclear deterrence and why that's a bad solution, um, offering as the alternative solution, a sort of a global nuclear disarmament, which is something that all of us would love to see, um, but it, it seems like that's some way off. Um, so I'm just, just wondering what your view is perhaps of kind of changes that we might want to bring about in the next five or 10 years that could move away from this really disastrous uh, mutual assured destruction paradigm towards something that is consistent with the long-term future of humanity. Can I reply? You, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I quoted at the beginning uh, President Obama, and, uh, and Obama, by the way, ended that quotation saying, yes, we can. And yes, we can was uh, the slogan of his campaign when he was elected president. So it was a serious uh, reminder of something that um, was possible. Um, I think that the elimination of nuclear weapons is not an impossible task. Um, Obama, again, in that quotation said, perhaps not in my lifetime. Many times when I've spoken or written about this, I had written years ago, before the last president in the United States, that uh, I, I was more optimistic. I expected that it would happen in my lifetime, although I'm much older than Obama. But on the other hand, I expect this to happen only after a catastrophic use of nuclear weapons. Only after that, I think, humankind will somehow understand the need of this and that will bring about the political changes which are required in the key countries, which are the United States, Russia, China, and perhaps uh, Europe, and then India, Pakistan, and so on. I think that this will happen probably on the other hand, once this change of uh, the frame of mind happens, the task is not difficult. It is much easier than the elimination of chemical weapons, which has been achieved because the treaty to 
eliminate chemical weapons is much more difficult to verify. The chemical industry is much more extensive. It's in a way much easier. And, and that was achieved by, by humankind. It, it, it hasn't worked completely, but it has essentially, it has brought in fact to the destruction of enormous chemical arsenals of chemical weapons. So this shows that the goal is achievable. It's a question of changing the frame of mind of uh, public opinions and uh, leaders in the world and get away from this completely foolish idea of uh, deterrence. And do you view that uh, a, a nuclear catastrophe is necessary or just sufficient for bringing about that change of mind? Well, the, whether the, the, uh, and, well I don't know. I mean, the, the, I think that if there is a nuclear catastrophe, that will, of course, uh, overwhelm the, the, this type of uh, thinking. Uh, but, you know, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an expert on public opinion, I'm not a politician, um, but I, I see there the, the source of the problem. And then also the prob problem is that the, there are uh, people who, you know, earn their living by uh, managing nuclear weapons and so on. So it's a, it's a change of paradigm, which is not easy to bring about, but it has been done with uh, chemical weapons, and so it's quite possible. And in a way, even this uh, new uh, treaty, which has just been uh, ratified by 50 countries, which has outlawed nuclear weapons, is a beginning of a road. You, it's true that uh, among the 50 countries that ratified it are not the countries that have nuclear weapons, but nevertheless, it's a important first step in that direction. And Malcolm, I guess I'll just turn the question on its head um, for you, because I think in your talk, you provided three really good uh, practical steps that we could take in the very short term towards moving towards a more sustainable world. But I guess the question then becomes, what would you see as your vision for where we're heading for this? What, what does the sustainable world community look like uh, in the long run? Um, in my field of trying to slow population growth, I think the things that follow are better education. Um, and so, because one of the problems that, for instance, Africa faces is a very large number of young men who have poor education and are not going to find a rewarding job. They're the people who become uh, terrorists. I mean, if I was in that situation, I'd probably be a terrorist. I totally understand it. So um, I think that, um, you know, that slowing population growth just has so many different ways, some of which sort of multiply each other. Um, and I think that it's achievable. It just, uh, I got into this field in the 1960s, 1980s, when it really was a priority, at least in the United States and in foreign aid out of um, the Protestant countries of Europe. But it's been pushed off the table. And I think mm -hmm. we need to put the role of population growth and our ability to slow it in the human rights framework back on the table. And I, hope that, I think this is one of the things that can come out of this. Um, it's like climate change. I mean, there are two things that are enormously important and we shouldn't let one sort of displace the other. We have to be, have the energy and commitment to keep on telling the same story again and again and again until people listen about nuclear weapons, population uh, growth and um, conflict. And I think that moves on to the, the other question I really wanted to put to both of you is about what should a researcher do when they become problems and they want to make a positive impact. And I wanted to say that one thing that uh, they have in common is Paul Ehrlich. Um, he's contributed a lot, obviously, to overpopulation, but he was also very important to the um, initiation of the nuclear winter hypothesis and really going big in that with that um, to kind of try and, and stimulate uh, Gorbachev and Reagan to engage in 
um, nuclear disarmament, and I think I was, you know, helped trigger one of the most productive periods of nuclear disarmament and cooperation that we've seen. So that kind of style of academic engagement where you just, you know, go out and make bold statements and stake your whole career on something. I mean, that's one way forward. Um, is that the way, the way that you would advocate or do you think that it can be uh, more sensible to take a more measured approach and perhaps, you know, try and provide a more objective source of information? I mean, what what is a, the responsible thing to do when you see such a, uh, a pressing global issue as a researcher? Uh, perhaps I'll put that one to Malcolm first. I think that it's um, re repeating the same story. Uh, one of the problems that faces us is that there are strong correlations, for example, between population structure and conflict. It's difficult to, to prove causal um, uh, sort of relationships here. But I think our intuition, uh, we should listen to our intuition and it tells us that if we can slow population growth, we'll have a less conflict um, filled world. You know, if you look at all the 4,000 species of mammals, actually killing your own species is a very Darwinian and unusual thing to do. Chimpanzees do it, or we do it, and possibly happiness, as far as I know, no other species of vertebrate systematically kills its own uh, species. So it's a curious um, behavior and one that we should analyze as, caref as carefully as possible. Um, and I think that it involved in chimpanzees and it has because it is to the advantage of the successful group of warriors that extend their a bigger territory that we get resources by killing other members of their own species. It's an unusual behavior, but the more insight we can get into it, um, I think the, the better. And Francesca? Well, it, I would say that what is required more than anything else to make progress is the universal acceptance of what was agreed by President Reagan and uh, then President Gorbachev. Uh, namely, they put it very succinctly, a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should not be fought. And I think very few people would disagree with this uh, statement. If you know, this is the basis. Then, of course, there are the political difficulties, but the changes in the world that have occurred from the Soviet Union on one side and the, the so-called Western world, United States, uh, NATO on the other side, uh, has changed because uh, the Soviet Union does not exist anymore. That is not a particularly liberal and democratic government in Russia, but nevertheless, it's uh, the idea that uh, there is the imminent risk that uh, Russia takes over the Western Union is, is really, nobody believes that anymore, or at least no sane person believes that anymore. So from this point of view, what, you, what were the fundamental reasons for uh, having the nuclear weapons uh, is, is no more there. There are difficulties. There are uh, you know, confrontations like India and Pakistan. There are uh, difficulties. But on the other hand, if the realization of the fact that the danger is very, very great, uh, then it's possible to make progress and the road to make progress is rather obvious. I mean, one must also <laughs> emphasize that the vast majorities of the countries of the world have renounced nuclear weapons unilaterally. The non-proliferation treaty has been signed. Most can many countries that could build nuclear weapons from a technological point of view have decided not to do that, even in spite of the fact that other countries had nuclear weapons. So it's not impossible to reach the goal of the elimination of nuclear weapons and have this uh, verified that would be easy as it has been done for chemical weapons. Uh, 
But for chemical weapons, it was done after they were used on a large scale during the First World War, and uh, people saw what were the sufferings. Nuclear weapons have also been used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, the consequences have been uh, pretty evident. But nevertheless, this has not uh, been enough in the context of the Cold War. Now the Cold War is over in the sense it, it, it existed. And so there, there are the preconditions for making progress in these directions. I, I think, of course, uh, there is now hope again because uh, the President Trump will not be there anymore. And that is uh, a major improvement, which I hope will bring good results in many fields, but in, part in this one in particular. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I dare say that was, you know, looking for concrete steps that could be taken, that was always going to be an important one. Um, although it, it is always problematic if the sort of the level of global risk that we face is too dependent upon who wins the US election, because it will swing forwards and backwards rather alarmingly. So hopefully there's a long term vision where US politics becomes less internationally important. But we'll see. Um, so turning now to questions from the audience. And the first question I'd like to ask is from Alicia Graves, who asked Malcolm about your book Sex and War. And um, what what assessment you have about actually linking these two and whether um, the population, you know, global population is a, a contributor to the currently the current level of nuclear risk and the risk of a World War Three. I, I didn't get the questions. What, what is the question? It was a question to Malcolm. Yes, but what is the specific question? So Malcolm wrote a book called Sex and War on the origins of conflict. And the question was asking about whether this applies to nuclear war as well. Yeah. Wars, as I was thought, as Hitler's perception was, he needed more rooms, uh, more space um, for the, uh, the Germans. And so if there are more people and the resources are always finite, that's one factor. The other factor is the structure of the population um, that men in the 15 to 30 year old age group, are certainly the ones that do most criminal acts, they're the ones that do most murders and they are the ones that are intensely loyal to one another, running up the beaches of Normandy or fighting in person. And so men are the warriors and women are the peacemakers. And so again, going back to my interest in women's autonomy, access to family planning so they can make their own decisions about their own life. We are seeing what tectonic changes are occurring in the United States as women, more and more women are elected to Congress and now are the vice president. This is an enormously important change and one that I feel is going to make for a more peaceful, harmonious world. Uh, men are the risk takers. Women are not risk takers. You can be pregnant and breastfeed in them. You can't do the crazy risk taking things that men do. And so there is a big uh, difference here and we should uh, value it and value the good things that both the sexes can offer and be aware of some of the dangers that are associated with testosterone filled men. I fully agree with everything that has been said by Malcolm. I fully agree. On the other hand, these issues have to do with a more a larger task, namely the elimination of war, or at least the elimination of you know major wars. I do not. I think this is, of course, a very desirable goal, and to some extent, it's. Uh, certainly achievable for mankind. There have been you know, much progress over the centuries. There are now international organizations, United Nations and so on. But nevertheless, the total elimination of wars is a goal which is not immediately achievable. The total elimination of nuclear weapons, or not the total elimination, but an agreement 
to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, faced over time could be made uh, you know, by the next president of the United States together with the rulers of China and uh, Russia. And uh, it, it, is, it is a feasible uh, achievement and in fact a necessary achievement because uh, unless this is made fairly soon, there is the risk that quite the opposite will happen, namely that the non-proliferation treaty will collapse and many more countries will acquire nuclear weapons. And, and, and that would be a, a very great disaster. And the time scale for this is not requiring a total change in the behavior of mankind. It is a, a political, uh, achievement that could be realized uh, very soon, as I say, uh, maybe in, in the next four years. <laughs> but I am not so optimistic. As I say, my pessimism is that unless there is a major catastrophe associated with uh, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, the people will not really com convince their leaders that that is necessary and urgent. Our next question comes from uh, Sonia Amadi and it's a question for Francesco. Um, so Sonia is um, interested in the US's continual sort of search for a military doctrine that would allow nuclear war to be containable. Um, so in terms of developing tactical nuclear uh, weapons and smaller scale nuclear weapons, for instance, um, in the hope that they can actually make a nuclear war one that they can win, or at least make their nuclear weapons into something that they can actually use within a winnable war uh, without it necessarily causing a, a global nuclear winter and a, a, a total catastrophe. Um, and I guess there's two questions that stem from that. Firstly, do you think this is a realistic uh, doctrine? Could there ever be a, a contained or a winnable nuclear war? And the second is in relation to your con your belief that a catastrophe may be necessary in order to bring about change, would such a nuclear exchange uh, allow for this to, to, to happen? And could that be um, an event that would then actually lead in the future to, to greater nuclear disarmament? Uh, the ideas the idea of a limited use of nuclear weapons was based on the previous uh, situation, mainly in uh, Europe and uh, Europe and uh, the Soviet Union. There was the idea that uh, the Soviet Union had an overwhelming uh, superior military capability that they could uh, take over Western Europe, and that therefore the only way to prevent this was the capability to use nuclear weapons and that therefore to develop usable nuclear weapons. I think this uh, theory is now completely discredited, in fact, and, it, it is, and in fact, there are now very few so-called tactical uh, nuclear weapons. And, and as I say, uh, the prevalent uh, idea is that a nuclear war cannot be fought and therefore cannot be won and therefore should not, should not be fought. I don't think that the issue of uh, uh, so-called tactical nuclear weapons is uh, very much uh, relevant uh, anymore. There are situations which are different from the situation between uh, involving uh, Russia, the United States, uh, maybe China, which, you know, this, this is not dealing with tactical nuclear weapons. There are situations like the confrontation between in Pakistan, where the danger of using tactical nuclear weapons is, is, is much more serious. And, uh, and, and that is, uh, in fact, the perhaps most likely circumstances in which uh, nuclear weapons might be used. But going into this in detail is a little bit um, complicated. And mm. that's to do with the local politics, uh, Kashmir, and also the 
great difference between uh, India and Pakistan in terms of size, capabilities, and, and so on. Um, so next time, I want to um, combine two questions for Malcolm that we've received from Didi Mwari and uh, Tom Hobson. Um, Didi is uh, one of our panelists in a future panel, and Tom is a researcher here at CESA. And both of them are concerned, to some extent, uh, Malcolm, that the policies you advocate um, are, may not be the right ones to solve the problem. Um, they're concerned that are you really addressing the underlying causes of the problems that these societies face, it, face or are you, uh, in a sense, looking at their symptoms? Um, are there actually other policies that are suited, in particular, female education? Um, and also, is there a risk that, however well-intentioned this kind of language and reasoning is, it has a habit when applied on the ground to lead to less desirable implementations in terms of coercion and uh, issues with you know in people's rights and so on um so a whole range of concerns about 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 the the use of family planning uh, within this context i don't know if you can see me when i go into a hospital in ghana see three women in one bed one on top who's very sick and two under well, quite so sick because they had unsafe abortions, then I have no, um, you know, I think it's silly to say that this is somehow or other, that you can overdo the emphasis on family planning. We should emphasize family planning. Women are telling us by dying that they want to control their fertility. It's meeting their needs, not telling them what to do. As a non-expert, I would say that uh, the, having more education of women in countries where women tend to be less educated is uh, an absolutely positive goal from all points of view. And the fact uh, that uh, women should have uh, the capability to control whether they want to have children or not is also, it seems to me, a very fundamental uh, human right that should be fostered in, in all ways. And uh, so for me, <laughs> this is uh, obvious, the, the, the direction to, to go, hopefully. Mm. There are those who are against this and uh, that is unfortunate. But, uh, so, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the concerns about this perhaps to, to bring another way in is that um, these are obviously issues, and I think this is true both for, for nuclear security and, and overpopulation, where there, there are amazing global injustices that lie at the heart of these problems. You know, there are some countries that have the military power, the economic power, the political power, um, and then there are many, many, many countries that don't have any of those, and many people living in, you know, uh, very disempowered, very um, marginal lives. And when we kind of look at these global problems and we come up with solutions that, um, you, you know, we, we have to be very careful, I guess, that we're not coming up with solutions that in a sense reflect our own position and our own uh, culpability um, and actually address the underlying cause. If, for instance, countries were wealthier, people, you know, weren't so so impoverished, wouldn't they, in fact, have, um, you know, demanded and received access to the same family planning rights as anyone else? Um, so there, there's a, an issue, I guess, about is this a fundamental cause of a problem, or is it, in a sense, a symptom of the underlying problem of global injustice? And are there actually opportunities to solve this problem further upstream? Um, no, I think that's overplayed. Queen Victoria had 10 children. She hated being pregnant. She was in a normal heterosexual loving relationship, did not have the information and means to separate sex from childbearing. If you don't have that, then you have. So making information available and the means in a purely voluntary way is a very necessary and important thing to do with a long history of compelling examples of how it has helped countries move forward. I mean, I've worked in, in, in South Korea 
I've seen changes even in, in, in Bangladesh, um, giving people choices and offering women autonomy, and of course, increasing women's education. But that is going to be better if you have slow in population growth. You need about 2 million new teachers in the developing world each year just to keep up with education. You get a better education when you have slower population growth. So another issue which is um, several people are asking on the questions in, in several different ways, I think is going back to this question about how global catastrophic risk um, reduction interfaces with actually the politics, um, particularly US politics. Um, you know, the US has traditionally been a very big funder of family planning. It also obviously is the largest um, possessor of nuclear weapons. And this is governed by quite particular um, dynamics within US politics and very conservative groups um, who for biblical reasons or for reasons of a perceived manifest destiny are very attached um, to certain policies. Now, we as academics don't tend to come from these circles. We don't naturally interface with them very well and we tend to be quite dismissive of them. Um, but I guess this is always a problem when we're actually trying to deal with global issues of how do we how do we engage with the fact that some of our opponents are very different to us from an ideological perspective um, and simply you know, have a different worldview, uh, which is actually what is leading them to oppose these kind of pol policies or proposals. I don't think I have anything particularly intelligent to say on this, but um, it's true that the United States have a great influence in the world and that what happens there is uh, very important and that uh, unfortunately there has been a polarization uh, going in the direction of, uh, you know, uh, America first, which is the same slogan as Hitler had, you know, Deutschland über alles. And uh, this is uh, very dangerous and, and, and very bad. But uh, it is not only the United States. There are also other uh, countries or other ideologies in the world which are also very negative. There is uh, you know, terrorism. Uh, Religion is often a cause of uh, conflicts. So all of these things uh, exist, uh, have existed through history, have caused through history uh, great uh, wars, uh, great losses, and uh, they are still uh, there to a considerable extent. My point, going back to nuclear weapons, is that we don't have to wait until the time where there are no more nationalists in countries, where there are no more people who believe that uh, you know, people having a different religion should be eliminated uh, and killed if possible. Uh, we don't have to wait for that. It is possible, uh, I think, even in the present world, to arrive at agreements which uh, eliminate nuclear weapons in time, which set up a process which will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons. It is possible. Uh, I don't know if it will be realized. Uh, it requires a change of mood in the key countries. And my idea is the change of mood will only happen after a major catastrophe. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But uh, this is, but on the other hand, it is a less difficult goal than having a humanity in which there are no more uh, conflicts. This, of course, will have to happen if humanity is going to continue, but it is uh, a more distant uh, goal, it seems to me. Malcolm? Um, I think across history and in most cultures begin as patriarchal societies, where men trying to co control women at a number of uh, levels, and it's a long, slow, painful process to sort of dilute and eventually strike down that tradition of, of patriarchal societies. And we can see that when women get more power, and it's not just one sort of prime minister like Margaret Thatcher, but a lot of women in legislatures, et cetera, then we have a more peaceful world making more sensible um, decisions and reducing some of the 
um, existential threats that we um, face. So I think you know there are profound differences between male and female behavior, and we want to do everything we can to enhance um, not only women's individual autonomy, which is their birthright, but also their role in society. I fully agree that <laughs> I must say that to the extent that I have had any, you know, small influence in uh, international affairs, I have always strived to involve more women than uh, there used to be in this um, issues, I mean, including the issues of uh, you know, arms control, uh, conflicts, uh, and, and so on. During my time as Secretary General of Pakwash, the number of women involved in the activities of Pakwash increased uh, very su substantially because I am, uh, I am a fe feminist in this sense. Oh, yeah. It's a great uh, achievement. <laughs> because I think it is rather obvious that this is what uh, should be done and that. Uh, Um, so we, we've got to end of most of the questions. So There's just one left, um, which I've kind of asked earlier from, from Adrian Kent, but he, he um, posed three possibilities, um, two of which we, we talked about earlier, which is, uh, this was in specifically in relation to nuclear weapons, uh, deterrence versus uh, disarmament. But he did offer this third um, option, which I think has often been the sort of go-to solution to global catastrophic risk problems, and that is world government. And... Um, this, this crops up from time to time. And I think one of the nice things about working in global catastrophic risk is it's an area where we think big enough that we can actually think about these issues. Um, so before we break for the next session, I just wanted to ask you what your views were both about perhaps the feasibility, but also the desirability of world government as a way to try and tackle some of these global challenges. Yep. And I think it's unlikely to achieve world government within the foreseeable future. I think we should welcome and strengthen those activities that are conducted at a global level, like the World Health Organization is a very good example of a successful um, group that has made enormous changes, uh, for instance, reducing infant mortality in so many um, countries, but without um, but it's still a long way from some kind of global government. But many of the things that we want to achieve, I think we could do with WHO type um, organizations. And they, there'd be a realistic possibility of building them and strengthening them. I, I would say that, you know, world government is uh, not uh, around the corner, but uh, there has been progress in that direction. Uh, the United Nations, for instance, who was you know, after the last World War, uh, has been a beginning in, in that direction. But not only that, I think uh, the world has changed the direction of becoming more of a single society. In my job as a theoretical physicist, we already have, to some extent, uh, achieved uh, a, a global uh, community. Uh, people uh, collaborate uh, all over the world, uh, work together with, uh, you know, with Chinese, with the Americans, uh, with the Russians, uh, especially you know, in these fields, uh, theoretical physics, mathematics, but not, not only in these fields. And we see collaborations which are uh, rather amazing. I mean, they send in space uh, in a little uh, satellite or whatever it's called, the capsule in space. There is a Russian, there is now a Japanese. There, is, there are many endeavors of humankind which are becoming uh, global. The political uh, the politics uh, eventually shall follow, will follow, we'll have to follow, but that will take time and uh, it will take uh, changing the frame of mind of, of people. But I think young people tend to be, tend to be uh, much more uh, ready to go in this direction. Although of course there are also 
neo Nazis, there are also neo uh, racist uh, young people. The, the change is, takes takes time; it's slow, but by and large, it seems to me that it goes in the right direction overall. And it's of course helped to some extent by the fact that people communicate uh, all over the world by these uh, technological means which have become available. That has also his backside because also uh, via this means uh, racism or nationalism or hate uh, is uh, spread around. But uh, I think the positive is uh, more than the negative and uh, eventually young people much more young people tend to, you know, communicate and recognize other young people without paying much attention of whether they uh, speak a different language or uh, a different color of their eyes or skin. Or uh, it, it, this is a trend which uh, is uh, proceeding. It, it will take time, but it is going faster and faster, it seems to me. So from this point of view, I think optimism is somewhat uh, justified yeah. and including the fact of involving more and more women women in governance in uh, science uh, in uh, in every uh, you know developments in advanced society and also in less advanced society not everywhere it goes uh, so fast but... I, I well thank you so the... much yeah. um Malcolm and Francesco, that's is a really stimulating discussion and so many points that, you know, I, I personally agree with and I'm sure many others will as well. And I'm, I'm certain that the next time we hold um, a, a panel looking at the sort of history of people who've made really significant contributions to the alleviation of global catastrophic risk, we will have a more diverse panel. And I think your words have been very encouraging to that respect. So thank you so much for that. Um, our you. next session will be a fireside chat uh, with uh, Fiona Hegarty, CESA's co-director, uh, talking with Toby Ord of the Future of Humanity Institute. Um, it, we'll break now, so you'll have about a 10 minutes uh, comfort break before the beginning of that. Uh, and as Catherine said in her talk, you'll need to click through on the Hoover agenda. Um, thank you ever so much to both our speakers and to all of you for participating and giving questions. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>